Good evening. Thank you all for coming. I'm Margaret Mims from the Department of Learning and Interpretation here at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston. Tonight, we conclude our three-part lecture series celebrating amazing Houston women and the extraordinarily significant roles they played in building the collections here at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston and their visionary roles in laying the foundations for the vibrant cultural, intellectual, and civic life of the city in which we all live. The amazing women in the Museum of Fine Arts Houston lectures are part of a larger citywide celebration of women organized by the Houston History Alliance to champion the countless ways that Houston women have made their mark on local, national, and global history. Uh, this collaboration is called Tales of Houston Women, and we're very pleased to join uh, the museum to join 21 organizations throughout the city all of whom have created programs to provide pers their own perspectives on how Houston women have rocked to their world. <laughs> the programs began last month and will continue through the middle of November, so there was a nice little flyer produced by the Houston History Alliance listing all of the programs on the inside. It's outside on the table, so if you don't already have one, please pick one up and uh, we hope you will join in some of the other programs around the city as our celebrations continue. Two weeks ago, author and historian Betty Trapp Chapman kicked off the series by taking us into the early decades of the 20th century and sharing what she's discovered about the life of Annette Finnegan, a woman who's a household name only inside the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, where her gifts to the museum became the foundation from which the antiquities collections have grown ever since. But when Texas A&M Press publishes the book that Betty's writing about Annette Finnegan, we hope, within, we hope that will be within the next couple of years, then I think all of us will have a much richer understanding of the many ways that Ms. Finnegan helped build a more enlightened Houston community. Last week, author Stephen Finberg took us inside the extraordinary life of Audrey Jones Beck. When Audrey Jones Beck died in 2003, the Houston Chronicle reported Quote, she was best known for the namesake Audrey Jones Beck Building at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston and for her personal collection of Impressionist and Post-Impressionist paintings, which she donated to the museum, end quote. She was the daughter of the legendary Houston entrepreneur and philanthropist Jesse Jones, who was appointed head of the Reconstruction Finance Corporation and later Secretary of Commerce by President Franklin Roosevelt. And for most of her growing up years, Audrey lived with her grandparents. She had wealth, she had knowledge, she was sophisticated and witty, but she also had a very deep commitment to making Houston a better place, which she did through her lifelong involvement with Houston Endowment, the charitable foundation established by her grandparents right here in Houston, and where Stephen Finberg met her, interacted with her regularly for many years about endowment business, and became her close friend. Audrey became involved with the Museum of Fine Arts Houston in the 1960s as she began building her collection of Impressionist and Post-Impressionist paintings, a collection that she always described as, quote, a teaching collection, because her, quote, goal was to assemble a representative sampling of Impressionist and Post-Impressionist paintings to demonstrate the wide variety of approaches that artists brought to these movements to people who know little, uh, l very little about art. The collection first came on view here at the museum in 1974 when the new expansion by Mies van der Rohe opened. That's the very large gallery on the upper, floor, upper level of this building. And the collection never left, though it now has its own galleries in the Audrey Jones Beck building across the street. But the list of people who give, who build, and then give away major art collections is exceedingly rare and very short. <laughs> Audrey Jones Beck was certainly one of them, and the woman who is our focus this evening is another, I'm a hog. The only daughter of James Stephen Hogg, the first native-born governor of Texas, I'm a hog overcame her unusual name and the loss of her parents at a rel relatively young age to emerge as an independent woman of means and devoted her talents and considerable family fortune toward nurturing the arts in Texas and to preserving the cultural heritage of Texas. In 1957, 
She donated her magnificent home and gardens called Bayou Bend, along with her exceptional collection of American furniture and decorative arts to the Museum of Fine Arts Houston to become a house museum of American decorative arts. I'm delighted this evening to welcome as our speaker, David Warren, the man who worked side by side with Ima Hogg during the last 10 years of her life to transform her home into a house museum. The re a renowned expert on American decorative arts, Mr. Warren is Bayou Bend's founding director emeritus. He graduated from Princeton University and he just completed his graduate training at the Winterthur program at the University of Delaware when in 1965, Ima Hogg hired him as the first curator of Bayou Bend. In 1987, he was appointed director of Bayou Bend Collection and Gardens, and he held that position until he retired in 2003. He's the author of a number of exhibition catalogs, among them Southern Silver, The Gothic Revival in America, Marks of Achievement, Four Centuries of American Presentation Silver, American Decorative Arts and Paintings in the Bayou Bend Collection and Bayou Bend Gardens, a, a Southern Oasis. In 1975, he co-authored with Lon Taylor the pioneering volume titled Texas Furniture, The Cabinet Makers and Their Work. And then in 2012 and 2013, he and Lon Taylor co-authored revised versions of Texas Furniture based upon more recent scholarship. But Miss Ima Hogg, her collections, her vision, her extraordinary life, and her remarkable legacy have always been Mr. Warren's passion. And just two years ago, he published the book from which the, the, the title of his talk is taken this evening, I'm a Hog, the Extraordinary Cultural Patron Behind the Unusual Name. Though he celebrates Ima Hogg's legacy, yet tonight he's going to celebrate Ima Hogg's legacy using details drawn from her diaries her letters and her papers, as well as his own first-hand accounts of working closely with her. I'm sure all of you saw that his book was for sale outside the auditorium as you came in tonight. Uh, during our talk, that uh, book cart will have moved upstairs to the lobby of this building, literally right above our heads, where we invite you to join Mr. Warren for a wine reception and a book signing. But now please give me a very, uh, please join me in giving Mr. Warren a very nice warm welcome to the lectern. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret, for your kind introduction. I first came to know Miss Hogg, as I always called her. Everyone else, those who knew her well and those who never met her, always called her Miss Ima. But I felt that that was not proper unless she asked me to. She never did, and I didn't. In the context of writing her biography, I came to refer to her simply as Ima. But I will also do so in this lecture. At any rate, I first came to know this extraordinary lady when I was interviewed at Bayou Bend for the position of curator of her Bayou Bend collection. She had given the collection to the Museum of Fine Arts in 1957, but retained the right to reside in the house as long as she wished. She was still living in the house and remained there for three, the first three months after I arrived as curator in July of 1965. I had the opportunity and the pleasure to see her every day, to walk with her through the collection, to see it through her eyes. So I'm honored to be here today to talk about I'm a hog as a collector. She was indeed an inveterate collector, not only of Americana, but also Native American pottery and European 20th century modernist works on paper. By her own description, she characterized collecting as a disease, one she noted she'd had from earliest childhood. We see her at left, age 83, photographed by Life magazine in the drawing room at Bayou Bend, Miss Rococo Chippendale style furniture. Copley's early portrait of a boy is in the background. As a little girl, as seen here on the right with her parents and brothers, she loved to gather the wild flowers and colored pebbles that lined the streets of Austin, where she lived while her father was Texas Attorney General and later Governor. Living in the historic Governor's Mansion and having the thrill of sleeping in the massive Sam Houston four-post bed 
gave the little girl a reverence for history and old things that would be an important influence on her in later life. I will not go into the story of her unusual name, but as you can see from the picture, there is only one little girl. As this lecture is only part of a citywide celebration of the contributions of Houston women, before I turn to Ima's collecting, I would like to touch on a few other areas of her life in which she showed an underlying quality of leadership and a bent towards being a founder of institutions that would make her city a better place. At the University of Texas, seen at the left with Vivian Bresner, one of a group of girls that became her dear college friends. Don't you love the hats? She was a member of the Ashbell Literary Society, an organization for female students on the campus, organized by female students on the campus as they were not permitted to participate in the male social societies. And she was a founding member of the first sorority on the campus, Pi Beta Phi. As an adult, there were two areas of great interest to Ima. One was music, the other, as we will see, was mental health. From her childhood, she played the piano, and in 1900, she moved to New York City, where for two years she studied piano at the National Conservatory of Music. Seven years later, she settled in Berlin, where over an 18-month period, she studied with two prominent pedagogues. One was a Dr. Martin Krauss, who had studied piano with Franz Liszt. Always a perfectionist, Ima realized after she returned from Berlin to Houston in 1908 that she was not going to be a great concert pianist. But she did not give up on music, and with the aim to make Houston a better and more cultured city, she was a prime mover in establishing the Houston Symphony in 1913. When I first wrote about her and the symphony, I said, wrote that she was the founder, which everybody in those days in the 60s was saying. She said, no, I was one of the founders. She always was careful not to take credit when it wasn't due. She served as a symphony president during the 19-teens and later in the 1930s and the 1940s. Another great interest was mental health, particularly in children. So in 1929, she founded the Houston Child Guidance Clinic one of the first in America. During the 1930s, she worked to establish at the University of Texas the Hogg Foundation for Mental Health, the first charitable foundation in the state of Texas. We see her at the left with the first director of the foundation, Robert Sutherland, with whom she worked very closely for many decades. In the early 1940s, uh, we see her at right, she was elected to the Houston School Board where she later served as president. Her vote as a new member on the board gave a majority which made possible the adoption of a new policy, equal pay for black teachers, and thus making Houston the first city in the South to do so without being forced by a lawsuit. The family company which managed their oil and gas interests was called Hogg Brothers. The Houston city directories for the company list equal partners, Will, Mike, Tom, and Ima. So in many different ways, Ima was an independent woman and a force within her city. In the 1960s at the Houston airport, there was a display of large photographic color portraits from the Giddings studio. The display was labeled, The People Who Make Houston Tick. All were prominent businessmen like Gus Wortham the head of the giant insurance firm, American General. The exception was Ima Hogg. But let's get to Ima as a collector. Her first exposure to art came in February 1902, when as a boarding school student in New York at the Montpelier School and studying piano at the National Conservatory of Music, a school that welcomed female students, her boarding school teacher took the class to the durand ruel Gallery to see an exhibition of the Impressionist painter Claude Monet. At the time, Ima noted in her diary that the exhibit was a real sensation. Later, as a mature woman, while in London at the outbreak of World War I, she avidly attended lectures at the Natural, National Gallery on Italian Renaissance artists and commented in her diary, I could stand until I dropped listening. It was also at this same time she showed her first interest in antiques. I fell to the allurement of a silver, gollop, silver goblet, she wrote. 
showing a healthy quality of weariness, she continued, claims to be George III. I have the antique fever now, and it hasn't hurt so far. It would be six years later that Ima began to really get involved with collecting antiques, in her case, colonial Americana. Throughout her life, Ima battled with periods of deep depression. But in 1917, when her beloved symphony, of which she was president, suspended its programming as America entered World War I, she felt she was a failure, that she had lost purpose. And the normally active and energetic Ima became deeply ill with paralytic depression. Suffering from what was then called hysteria, in 1918, she was sent to Philadelphia for a rest cure and treatment under the care of an eminent doctor who specialized in such cases. She would be in the rest home for more than two years. In 1920, considerably better, Ima was in New York City visiting her brother Will, who had an apartment there. Will commissioned the artist Wayman Adams to paint Ima's portrait, which we see at the right. As she sat in Adams' studio, Ima's natural curiosity was reawakened. And her, as her eyes wandered about the studio, she noticed a simple maple rush-seated armchair, which we see at the left. It was not like anything she remembered ever seeing before. And she was stunned to learn from Adams that was made in the mid-1700s of the colonial era. While she knew about old furniture like the 19th century Sam Houston bed, she did not know until that moment that things from the 18th century colonial era even existed. And that knowledge excited her hugely. A few days later, she visited the Madison Avenue gallery of New York's premier dealer, Collings and Collings, where she thought where she saw what she thought was an identical chair and thrilled she bought it on the spot. We see the chair she bought on the left. What is interesting is that Ima's chair at the left, while similar, is so much more elegant with its fluid lines, curving arms, scroll arm terminals, compared to the rather stiff lines of the Adams chair. And so with this purchase, unbeknownst to her, her collecting of Americana began. An interesting but telling diversion from our narrative. I'm a kept track of the Adams chair, and some 45 years later, she acquired it from the artist's estate. When it arrived at Bayou Bend and was uncrated, I'm a, who by that time had a very mature sense of what was good, remarked to me, oh, it's a dumb chair. <laughs> I don't know why I got so excited. To which I responded, I agree, it is dumb, but I'm so glad you got so excited. Look what came about as a result, the Bayou Bend collection. But back to our story. Collecting Americana indeed excited her. She conceived the idea to collect for a museum in Texas. In 1920, there was none. So that people here would, have, would know about colonial Americana. She wrote to her older brother, Will, I want to make you a proposal, as I have my own ideas about antiques and am fond of collecting them, let me do that. The letter is important, an important window in understanding where Ima was at that time. The new pursuit of collecting gave her a renewed purpose for life. Yet in that pursuit, in pursuit of that purpose, as a single woman, she was dependent financially on having her brother's permission. Fortunately, Will became an ardent supporter, and Ima plunged in. She bought early pieces, such as this oak pilgrim-style table from New York on the left, which in its simplicity seemed very American to her. But she also bought more elaborate examples, such as this mahogany Rococo Chippendale high chest from Philadelphia. Ima was among the pioneers collecting Americana in the 1920s, and her competitors included such minor poor people as Henry Ford, John D. Rockefeller, and Henry Francis DuPont, who was voraciously collecting for his Delaware home winter tour. Collins and Collins, the dealer, dealer from whom she bought her first chair, 
had taken to setting aside choice items for Mr. DuPont. One day, a rare Massachusetts chairback set tea and eight all sweet side chairs had been delivered to the gallery. And before they could be squirreled away from Mr. DuPont, Ima came in, loved them, and purchased, the whole, purchased them on the spot. Later, DuPont arrived and was dismayed to discover that this rare item had, these rare items had eluded him. In the 20s, Ima did not know the other collectors, and it was not until after World War II that she, be, she became acquainted with some of them, including and, and making lasting friendships. Among them were Maxim Karolek, Electra Havemeyer, Electra Havemeyer Webb, Catherine Prentice Murphy, as well as Harry, as he was fondly called, Harry DuPont. So 40 plus years later, after Ima and Harry had become friends as well as friendly competitors, DuPont and his right wo wife, Ruth, came to Houston to a house party at Bayou Bend. Upon his arrival, DuPont strode into the house and immediately wanted to see my settee <laughs> at the left, which was installed in, with the eight side chairs in what was then known as the Blue Room, today called the Massachusetts Room, as all the furniture is from that state. And you see the settee and some of the chairs on the right. A late 1920s purchase was this beautiful lady's desk. When I came to Bayou Bend as a curator in 1965, I discovered the desk was inscribed with initials T S for the maker Thomas Seymour. The Seymour name as the maker had been associated with the desk since the early 1930s when a virtually identical example became widely known in Americana circles. So it was very exciting both to Ima and to me to have this new documentation for her desk. Some years later, when Ima was visiting the home of Houston collectors Jeannie and Bill Kilroy, they proudly showed her their most recent acquisition, a similar desk. Ima's quietly competitive side was revealed when she remarked, mine is signed, is yours? Ima's collecting in the 20s was not limited to furniture. In 1922, she bought an important group of Tucker porcelain, including a rare pair of fruit baskets and six pairs of pitchers. In the, 1920, in the 1820s, the Philadelphia factory of William Ellis Tucker produced the first commercially successful porcelain made in America. At the same time, she bought early glass, such as this pocket bottle and pair of candlesticks after the 1923 sale where she bought the glass, she wrote her brother Will describing, quote, the things I thought so wonderful for which I paid so dearly. Nevertheless, I'm the proud possessor of some rare specimens of Stiegel and Wisterberg glass. In the late 1920s, I must collecting branched out into two very different disparate areas, Native American pottery and European modernist works on paper. In the late summer of 1928, Ima traveled to Santa Fe. There in the atmospheric Spanish colonial old town, Ima, in an experience similar to her discovery of Americana eight years earlier, was entranced with the arts of the Indians. Just as the arts of colonial America could persuade, provide Texans with a bridge to the colonial American history, so the arts of the indigenous Americans could serve a similar purpose she was particularly taken with the pottery, and by the time her month-long visit was over, she had purchased a staggering 117 pieces for her collection, which would include this rare Casas Grandes Macaw pot dating from around 1300 AD. So her collecting of American Indian material began. Some was installed in the library at Bayou Bend, as we see on the right, alongside of her early furniture and glass which is displayed in the bay window. We see it here in a photo made for the magazine House and Garden in 1931. All her Indian pottery was given to the Museum of Fine Arts in 1940. In the summer of 1929, she traveled to Russia, and in her words to me, I saw modern art for the first time, and it knocked my socks off. Clearly, in her mind, the 1902 schoolgirl exposure in New York to Monet's Impressionism did not 
count. While she was, what she was referring to were the amazing collections of Cezanne, Matisse, and Picasso assembled by Ivan Morozov and Sergei Shukin, confiscated by Lenin and by then on exhibit in the State Museum of New Western Art in Moscow. I'm uh, as impressed and excited by what she saw as she had been by the earlier, by, earlier by Americana and Indian pottery, responded on her way home when she stopped in Paris where she bought, we see on the left three women at the fountain, one of two Picasso works on paper, and on the right an oil portrait of Matisse's mistress, Lorette. While these 1929 purchases may not seem so bold today, we must bear in mind that the Museum of Modern Art did not actually open until later in the fall of that same year. By, the time, by this time, Imus Collecting of Americana had been suspended. In the early 1930s, a lover of German culture since her days in Berlin, she pursued 19th century works on paper by German expressionists, lyrical works like this lovely watercolor on the right by Max Pechstein, Landscape with a Cow. In 1939, she gave her collection of 80 modernist works to the Museum of Fine Arts. A decade later, she also gave the Matisse to the museum, but she retained the two Picassos. When she moved to Bayou Bend, from Bayou Bend to Inwood Manor in 1965, incidentally, taking with her two grand pianos and her servants, period, that was all she took when she left. <laughs> when she moved to Inwood Manor in 1965, she borrowed back some of the drawings, including the Pechstein, and hung them in her bedroom. After I came to be curator in 1965, when I commented on how remarkable it was that she had collected this avant-garde art, she replied, oh, they're so old hat now, even people who don't like modern art like them. Yeah. During the 1930s, Imus Collecting Energies were focused on developing her neo antebellum garden at Bayou Bend. You see here the East Garden and the Diana Garden these gardens which prominently displayed the quintessentially southern shrubs, camellias, and azaleas. It was not until the early 1940s that she began collecting, collecting again Americana. Acquisitions included uh, this New York Chippendale side chair, one of a pair, but also in an interesting and bold di uh, diversion from the colonial, she bought a Victorian Rococo revival parlor set made by the innovative New York cabinet maker, John Helter, Henry Belter. One piece is at the right, seen here at the right. Innovative in that he invented a process of being able to bend wood under steam pressure to create these curved, very thin and delicate lines. At that time, only the Brooklyn Museum was collecting Rococo revival, and it would not be until more than 30 years later, in the late 70s, that the Metropolitan Museum opened its Belter parlor. If I may diverge from chronology here, it was always Ima's plan to have a belter par at Bayou Bend, and indeed it came to fruition in 1971. When I was interviewing for the position of curator in 1964, she commented to me, I think belter is very important, don't you? I had no idea in my vast winter tour trained expertise what Belter was. But not wanting to show my ignorance, I mumbled, oh uh, yeah. <laughs> in the late 1960s, as the work was on, in progress on the new parlor, I'm a, in New York, visited the Israel Sack Gallery. The Sack brothers, Harold and Albert, inquired what she was up to, and she said, Belter. They said, what? She said, her response, it's the coming thing, boys, you better get with it. Back to chronology. After the Second World War, she wrote to Joseph Downs, the curator of the American Wing, asking for his advice. As she noted, I have not been collecting for some time and feel a bit rusty. Yet at the same time, she was making important acquisitions, such as this Salem or Boston bed and this rare Boston Bombay desk and bookcase. She was refining her collection with the goal in mind that it would go to the Museum of Fine Arts, and, would, and thus it needed the very finest examples. It was about the same time she was visiting New York dealer 
Israel Sack, whom she finally called, fondly called Old Sack, as opposed to his sons. And discussing important forms she should add to the collection. One he noted was a Newport block and shell knee hole desk. He related that he knew of one that belonged to an old lady, but it was not for sale yet. Four years later, Ima, who was traveling in Europe, received a telegram which simply said, the old lady died, <laughs> signed Isaac. She wired back, buy it, signed IHOG. <laughs> In telling the story, she said, it was all so short and cold-blooded, but I really wanted that desk. <laughs> Indeed, Sack was able to purchase it on Ima's behalf. We know today that it was made in Newport by the prominent cabinet maker, John Townsend. It was in this period that she was able to acquire such major pieces as this Philadelphia Rococo style Chippendale chest, uh, chest on chest, which features rare fire gilded hardware and its original crowning carved cartouche, or this Boston Queen Anne style turret top tea, tea table, hard to say turret top tea table, one of about six that are known. And later, such other rarities as this Boston Chippendale easy chair with its original flame stitch pattern wool embroidery show cover, one of only three known. And this Japan Queen Anne high chest, also from Boston, also one of three. The other two closely related examples are at the Metropolitan Museum and Winter Tour. In both cases, Ima was ahead of the curve when it came to conservation of these two pieces. She insisted that whatever be done be minimal. So the high chest Japan surface, surface was simply given a coat of clear shellac to preserve any further de deterioration rather than being repainted. Today, of the three examples known, Ima's is considered to retain the most original decoration. For the flame stitch, she insisted that the treatment be completed without disturbing the upholstery, rather than removal and cleaning as was customary. At times, Ima showed a certain amount of courage and self-reliance in her acquisitions. Two examples are this New York corner chair with its rare carved carving on the crest trail. In 1958, while summering in New England, she had been regaled by friends and collectors that the Israel Sack firm had been duped into buying a dud. When she got to New York, she hurried over to their gallery and asked immediately to see their folly. When she saw it, she felt it was 100% right and bought it on the spot, today a much valued and rare piece at Bayou Bend. Earlier in 1952, she was offered a rare Newport desk and bookcase, one of 12 known, mostly already in museum collections. It had been previously offered to Henry DuPont, who turned it down, as did noted collector of Rhode Island furniture, Ralph Carpenter. Ima persevered and bought it. It was the last such example on the market for the next 37 years, um, when later in 1989, the Brown family example was sold at auction for $12.1 million. In the mid-1950s, the idea of leaving the collection at Bayou Bend rather than transferring it to the main museum building began to crystallize. In 1954, Ima had a big house party and a number of prominent collectors came. Electra Webb, who established Shelburne, Henry Flint, who created historic Deerfield, Catherine Murphy, and as been mentioned, Harry and Ruth DuPont. Mr. DuPont told me that during this visit, he strongly encouraged her to do just that leave the collection in situ, just as he had done at Winter Tour in Delaware a few years earlier. This development meant that the collection would be displayed in rooms rather than museum galleries, and so the furniture would need to be augmented with paintings. So it's also in the mid-1950s that Ima began to collect American portraits. In late 1953, New York dealer Norman Herschel had written to Museum of Fine Arts director Lee Malone that he had been told by Boston collector Maxim Karolik that Ima was going to collect colonial portraits. When Malone wrote via letter, when Malone via letter queried Ima about her interest, she responded that, also by letter, indicating that she did not intend to make a collection like Karolik had done, but she might acquire a few. Then, in the next 12 months, 
she bought a late 1760s John Wollaston of Charlestonian William B. Holmes at the left, an Edward Hicks Peaceable Kingdom and Penn's Treaty dating from the 1820s on the right, John Sickleton Copley's, uh, two John Sickleton Copley oils, unknown boy of the late 1750s on the left, an early example of the artist's work, and the 1771 portrait of Elizabeth Richard painted in his Mutura style. Two copy oils as well as two copy pastels and five copy drawings. All this in a 12 month period. Not a bad way to start. It was also in the area of paintings that Ima showed rare, her true colors as a collector who stretched her resources to get what she wanted. One example was an early 1780s portrait, self-portrait of Charles Wilson Peale, who was shown painting a portrait of his wife, Rachel, while his daughter, Angelica, acting as a muse, guides his brush. It had been offered to Harry DuPont, who thought it was too expensive. It was sent down on approval to Bayou Bend and was installed in the drawing room where one of the Picassos usually hung. Ima loved it, but it was very expensive. And so she later told me she could not sleep a wink that night, worrying about the cost, but also worrying about when, if ever, she would have the chance to get another appeal self-portrait. So when the sun came up, she resolved to figure it out, figure a way to buy it. The dealer and the painting were on their way from their hotel to the railroad station, when, just in the nick of time, Ima was able to intercept them, relate her desire to buy the peel, and have the picture brought back to Bayou Bend. The other example was a portrait by the rare colonial artist Robert Feek. It is a mid-1740s Philadelphia example depicting a woman named Anne McCall. Ima had earlier been offered a pair of modernist bust -length, modest bust-length portraits by Feek, but declined them and wrote to the dealer that she thought a more ambitious three-quarter length portrait was what Bayou Bend should have. The dealer, Robert Vose of Boston, told her he knew of one, but the painting was not really for sale. However, the owners would not be offended if Ima indicated an interest, Ima indicated that she might be interested in it. She did indicate her interest, and eventually the owners agreed to a sale. However, the price was a staggering $125,000 more than double Ima had ever paid for anything. Undaunted, Ima screwed up her courage and decided to sell her two beloved Picassos, which were no longer relevant to what she was trying to do, build a fine collect and representative collection of colonial American painting, for which Robert Feek was key. As it turned out, only one Picasso was sold to Norton Simon, the other, the three women she later gave to the Museum of Fine Arts. After Bayou Bend was given to the Museum of Fine Arts and opened as a house museum in 1966, Ima had plans as had been seen to create a Belter parlor. However, realizing the importance of the late classical empire period of the 18 teens and 20s, she first undertook to create a suite of rooms in that style. Two early acquisitions for the new room were a New York sideboard, which we see at the right, and a Philadelphia center table we see in the middle of the room. While the new room was under construction, the two pieces um, were stored in the Bayou Bend kitchen. At the time, Ima's dear friend, New York collector, Catherine Prentice Murphy, was visiting Houston. Ima brought her over to Bayou Bend to see her new treasures. Mrs. Murphy thought that worthwhile antiques should not date later than about 1750. However, when she saw Ima's two new pieces, she trilled, oh, Ima, if I thought Empire Furniture looked like that, I'd like it. <laughs> During much of the late 1960s and 70s, Ima concentrated on collecting Texas German furniture which she was installing in a complex of houses at Windale near Round Top. It all began when she learned of a remarkable building in Windale, the so-called Stagecoach Inn, and after an abortive plan to move it to Houston, Ima began to restore it in situ. As a great Germanophile, she was thrilled with the idea of uniting her two loves, Germany and Texas, so she decided to create a complex 
which would be used to interpret the cultural contributions of Texas Germans in the mid-19th century. Toward that end, she sought out locally made furniture, two prime and, docu two prime and documented examples. A sofa, part of a suite of parlor furniture made in Anderson by Christopher Friedrich Carl Steinhagen. Aren't the fish wonderful? <laughs> and a wardrobe made in round top and signed by Christian Afroblock. Both had descended in the families of the original makers. Ima, in her persuasive ways, was able to convince the owners to part with them, their family heirlooms, for her project at Winedale. While well, Ima's collecting slowed considerably as she entered in the early 70s, love the hat, the instinct was still there, and she still had a list of desiderata. One was a portrait of the Connecticut artist Ralph Earle. In 1975, en route to Europe, she made a detour to Boston to see the Museum of Fine Arts Bicentennial Exhibition, Paul Revere's Boston. While there, she visited the Vos Gallery and found Earl's portrait of the Hartford doctor, Mason Fitch Cogswell, whom we see at the right. She loved it, and she asked Vos to hold it until she returned from her trip. She journeyed on to London, a city she deeply loved. There, she was injured in a fall while getting into a taxi following a shopping spree at Harrods. Sadly, before she could return to America, she died in a London hospital. Not surprisingly, although aged 93, as her life ended, she was still in the act of collecting. The painting was acquired um, in her memory for Bayou Band by funds provided by the Museum of Fine Arts. I'm as a legacy as a collector who happily throughout her life suffered from the collecting disease has made the cultural life of Houston and Texas much the richer. While she's been gone for more than four decades, through her generosity and philanthropy, her light remains bright. Thank you very much. Sure, sure. Maybe we'll take just a, a handful of questions. Anybody? I told you everything. <laughs> <laughs> She seemed a very personable woman. And she was, seemed like the, somebody who was very welcome to everybody, or to talking to people, or was she reserved? Or She was naturally very shy, um, but she loved working with people, and she would overcome that, especially to get accomplished what she wanted to get accomplished. She was wonderful at organizing women to do things that never occurred to them to do until she suggested it, as one docent mentioned to me. <laughs> um, but she was always, she was a great lady, and she was always very gentle and genteel, uh, and there was nothing imperious uh, about her, uh, even though she was regarded with sort of wonder by much of the city uh, of Houston. You're obviously the cream of your crop, but how did she come to call you? Well, it was the connection to Winter Tour. Uh, in the program that I was en enrolled in, a study of American decorative arts, a graduate program. And <laughs> no, I wasn't the only student, uh, but um, anyhow, um, I was recommended by Charles Montgomery, who had been the director and my teacher, and he had also been very helpful to Ima in the transition from a house to a house museum. And so um, in the summer of 1964, my parents had a cocktail party and the Montgomery's were there and he said, I think you should think about Bayou Bend. I said, Bayou, what? <laughs> he said, it's in Texas. And I said, oh. <laughs> <laughs> However, to humor, Montgomery and I came to Houston and I saw the collection, which was absolutely fabulous. And um, she liked me and I liked her and I guess the rest is history. David, was there ever a piano at Bayou Bend? Was there ever a piano? <laughs> in the drawing room, there was a grand piano, 
and in the what's now the Queen Anne sitting room upstairs, which was her sitting room off her bedroom, was the baby grand piano. And those were the two pieces of furniture she took with her when she moved from Bayou Bend to Inwood Manor at age 83. Okay, well, thank you. <laughs>